Hi guys, it's Matt here from MTS Books, and today I'm here with a very exciting video. Now, over these past three weeks, I've been reading the book Secrets of Jinshei by Alma Alexander for, for the MTS Read Along. Now, so far, I've posted two videos, and they're both discussion videos. And the first half of those discussion videos um, are spoiler free. So if you are interested in learning more about the book, then you'll find them linked below and you can go ahead and watch them. Tomorrow there'll be another video that goes up in which I will be discussing the final sort of topics and it's going to be a very interesting one um, and it will be kind of a culmination of everything that people have been talking about so far throughout the commentary that we, has been going on both on Twitter and here on YouTube. The whole read along has been absolutely fantastic and I cannot wait to share with you the final video and to get to know more about what everyone has thought of once they finish reading the book. Um, if you haven't read the book yet, then you are more than welcome to check back on the hashtag MCS Read Along um, and look through the past videos to find out um, how I've been talking about them and what sort of things are interesting to consider when you are reading the book. Um, and I will always be open to questions or to comments about the book. Um, you can either hit me up on Twitter or comment on any videos in regards to the book. Um, and I'm always absolutely willing to talk about it. So now for this video, we have been very fortunate in that Alma Alexander, the author of The Secrets of Jinshe, has been very kind and considerate and willing to join in and participate as much as possible throughout this read-along, which has been absolutely wonderful and has given us lots of little tidbits about the overall story and the writing process that went into it. Now, Alma also offered her time in recording answers to some questions that I had um, that go alongside the read-along, but are also very interesting questions for people who are just interested in how authors write books or the sort of things that might come up within this book if you're going to read it and the certain themes that kind of crop up and why they were chosen etc. So I hope that there's lots of information here that everybody can get something out, out of um, and enjoy um, because it was such a great experience to, to be in contact with Alma and to have her answer these questions. So now I emailed the questions to Alma and she filmed videos for each question um, with her answers. And in her little clips, Alma did start with the question that I had asked. So I'm not gonna go through and read out the questions to you again because you'll hear me hearing them twice, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of context as to why I asked each question before each video. So the first question I asked, actually inspired by the first live chat that um, I hosted on Twitter, um, and Alma got involved in that and said some really interesting things. I'll post a picture here of the tweets that Alma shared that inspired me to ask this question because they they give you that just that little bit of insight into what it's like to be a writer and writing a fantasy novel like this. So let's go and hear Alma's thoughts on this question. Hi, this is Alma Alexander, and I'm answering questions concerning um, my writing, specifically The Secrets of Jin Shei, which is a subject of the read-along by MCS Books. The first question that was asked was, you said on Twitter that you re read widely to learn about the context of the story, then lived the world for three months while writing. What were your favorite things that you learned about during this period, and what made you finally choose an Imperial channel to inspire your world? Did you read any other fictional books with similar themes, or was it strictly non-fiction? The short answer to that was that I didn't really choose Imperial China, it chose me. Um, I started this book as I believe I said somewhere else in... Um, in, in context. Uh, I basically sat down one day and I wrote ten paragraphs, um, each of which was a character description. That was all I knew at that point. Um, I, my husband asked me, what is that? And I said, my next book. He said, I hate you. <laughs> um, it turned out that this particular thing then evolved into um, something that got triggered by an article that a friend of mine sent me about Nushu, which was the secret women's language, the secret written women's language that was passed on from mother to daughter in um, in old China, um, in historical China. And when I read that, those ten characters, who are still nameless at this point and still had no context as such, basically sat up and said, "That would be us." So I started writing Jin Shei, and I literally wrote two hundred thousand words in three months less than three months. It was an unbelievable white heat writing thing. The things that got learned by serendipity, I mean, part of my uh, my story involved alchemy, and I knew it was going to involve alchemy at a certain point, but I was, I was dealing with the European ideas of alchemy, and for some reason I decided to research whether Oriental worlds had anything similar or resembling that, and it was absolutely astonishing 
to me that I discovered that there's an entire body of knowledge about Chinese alchemy that was based in a Chinese setting and it, it just all gelled at that point. The whole thing just, I kept on finding out things that I, exactly the things that I needed to, to make this world work. It was like that book basically wrote itself in the back of my mind and then just kept on feeding me information to make it become realer and realer as I, um, as I did, as I carried on. Didn't read any other fiction in preparation, but I've got piles of books um, for this and most particularly for the second book in this, in this particular, I'm not going to call it a series, they're not really... Uh, they don't follow on, they're standalones, but Embers of Heaven, which follows this book 400 years and along the, down the line in the same world. I just read everything I could find on it, um, including that started with, with coffee table glossy photographic evidence books, which I used to just look at the pictures and, and you know, uh, get into that world by osmosis through just looking what it looked, through seeing what it looked like and, and just getting into the, the feel of things by the visual, surrounding myself by the visual um, evidence of it. Um, and I read, um, I read biographies, I read autobiographies, I read Chinese historical um, books. The problem with something like this, obviously, is that um, you have to rely on secondary sources because obviously I don't read Chinese. So in one sense it was always uh, research from like one, one, uh, one divide down, but I read in in, in terms of quality and quantity. Um, I just read a lot, and I read everything I could get my hands on. Not only that, but it was it was a, a whole heap of, of a shelf and a half full of books that, that concerned these two particular novels. And of course, I went onto the internet as well. So I've got folders and folders of printouts that I took off the internet. Various articles that I found that weren't um, necessary and interesting at the time. I think the only way to do a book like this is to immerse yourself into the kind of background that you're using for an inspiration. It is not true, it is not supposed to be true, but all the things that you read are... If you never heard of it, there's something called an iceberg uh, theory of writing. And what you, as the reader, see is, is the story, which is just the tip of the iceberg. All the rest of it, all the stuff that this is based on and it, that makes it stable and it makes it work, it's all under the water and it's the, the big part of the iceberg and all the research that, that went into it. Some of which you never, you'll never know that I know, <laughs> but it made a difference to the writing of the book. So the second question came from a little story of how I actually found this book. I picked this book up at my grandma's house. She was going to give it away to a um, charity event. I remember looking through this box and there really not being anything. Grandma and I had very different reading tastes. However, sometimes, especially in regards to fantasy, or well, there is a bit of crossover. So I saw The Secrets of Jinshe and I was automatically appealed to it because of the cover. Um, and I loved the synopsis and I sat down and started reading it. The next thing I know, I read it for the entire stay that I was staying with my grandma, fell in love with it and kept that book and treasured it to this day. However, there were a few thoughts that I had about this book and my experience of reading it the first time and I wanted to ask Alma this question. I picked up this book not knowing anything and wondered whether I was the imagined audience for it, but I think it definitely bends genres in various ways. Was this an active choice on your part to play it with the ideas of genre and then who did you have in mind in being the audience who would read and enjoy this book? I myself do wonder whether genre choices either by authors or marketing teams impact the demographic of readers. Historical fantasy is something that I love reading. Um, my, uh, my particular addiction is Guy Gabriel Kay. I mean, if you've never read any of his books, you should run and read them. And most particularly, you should pick up a book called Tigana, which is just amazing. Um, but this thing in it doesn't really bend genres i mean there is such a thing as historical fantasy it it's out there um there's other books just like it there is a particular set of readers that that love it in some ways game of thrones is well more fantasy than historical but it was really it was based on a historical period so it does have that underpinning too which is I'm not going to say it's partly why it's so popular, it's popular because it's popular, but um, it actually has a, an underpinning of real history, um, which 
does seep through if you look for it in that more fantastical part of the, of the story. As far as I was concerned, I don't think I wanted to go out to bend genres in that kind of context, but I do write very lush and lyrical prose, which makes it by default more literary than your average genre book. Um, because the more average genre book might depend on the tropes more than on language or uh, that kind of level. I didn't have an audience in mind. I didn't write this for somebody in specifically, although it was instructive at one point when I did uh, a reading in one of the early um, book tour um, events of the book. And I did a reading, and um, usually the, the the audience were leaning towards female. And there was one particular reading in which a bunch of maybe five or maybe six young men, boys, uh, turned up and marched in and sat down very firmly in the seats over there and, and just sat there and looked at me expectantly in a slightly bewildered manner. And then I started talking and I started explaining about the book and when I got to the point of the women's language and, and what the book was about they just stood up one after another and walked out and a mad jack of them just walked out of there. Um, I have a horrible feeling they were expecting the secrets of Jin Shea to be some sort of kung fu demonstration which it was not. So um, they were definitely not the demographic. Um, but this book has been read by a vast range of people, so um, I'm not sure about the demographic that was aimed at as such. It was, if you really want to, to, uh, to go that way, the demographic I write for are people who love to read. And there's a lot of us out there. So those are, that's the audience that I write for. Um, and my, my first and primary thing when I write a book is to produce a story that is well written and that people are going to like to read and get immersed in. So that's my demographic and it makes it difficult and I appreciate it makes it difficult for marketing people because they don't have a specific kind of person to aim this at but that's the way I write. So the third question very much goes alongside the first discussion video that I made about The Secrets of Dinshe, given that it is a fantasy book. It was also inspired by um, a question that Ian from the Devon Book Club asked me when he was reading the book. And I thought, well, I can't exactly answer this. So let's get Alma Alexander to answer it herself. And here is what she said. Your world building has been a point of fascination for me and other readers. It's so richly done. One very interesting part is a poetry that is presented before each section of the novel by Chulin. What made you lay out your story in this way, with these poems at the start of each part, and was the poetry of Chulin something that you had written specifically for these areas, or part of your planning and devising of the world? The epigraphs were written as I created the divisions and what they meant. Um, the epigraphs were written to illustrate the concept of each division, because the book was actually set out as a lifetime as a series of stages of growth of a human being and that is something that is not original to me obviously I mean there is a lot of philosophies that have these kind of divisions but the the stages and the words describing them and the concept of each stage that was specific to me and to this book that was just something I created for Jin Shea, for the Jin Shea world as I went along. So um, the epigraphs that precede each section are original poetry and, well, in case you didn't know it, Julian was me. The fourth question very much is something that has interested me and interests me a lot about literature um, and all kinds of like storytelling. Um, it's also going to be a big subject that I'm going to discuss in tomorrow's video. So if you are interested by this question and Alma's answer, definitely check out my video tomorrow um, because I'll be kind of taking Alma's answer a little bit further and kind of exploring it through my perspective of the story. And here is what she had to say about it. 
The story of Jin Shea spans an entire lifetime and your original started off with sketches of the characters as young girls. What compelled you to trace their story from start to finish and is there particular significance for you in the lives and deaths that unfurl during this period? Well, of course there is. They're my characters. They're my girls. They are all very much me in one sense or another. Um, it's it's a little bit like developing a sort of split personality um, thing and creating a character for each personality that you carry inside of you. Um, there is a little bit of tie in me because I'm always the one chronicling things in poetry when, when, when I need to. There's my father's favorite character who was what he called the little guard, Chafon, because he said he saw a lot of her in me. The kind of person who would have deep convictions and who would fight for them no matter what um, and I like to think that's true. If that's true then I've also got Lidan in me and <laughs> well I suppose all of us carry those bits too. Um, so the significance for these characters and their lives is basically me releasing parts of myself and, and watching them be born, live out their lives and die on the page. And it's significant in the sense that I'm always a part of these, part of all my characters, and in particular these characters. I'm not sure that there's such a thing as being compelled to trace their story, but this book was literally taking dictation in some places, because I had eight different protagonist characters basically pulling me by the sleeve and demanding that it was their turn on the main stage right now so I could stop listening to that other person and start listening to them. This is a tough one to answer. Um, the meaning inside the story is the story. Um, I don't think I was compelled to do anything about it except to listen when they insisted on telling me the story that they needed told. But the story that they needed told was apparently an, one that absolutely came out. What you see in this book, what you read in this book, um, is an astonishing thing because usually first drafts of every novel are terrible and they're supposed to be, that's what they're for. But the first draft of Jin Shea was the cleanest thing I've ever written and what you see in that book is almost, almost what I wrote as the original manuscript. I suppose the significance of this is that it was a story that I had to write. It was something that was burning inside of me and until I got it down on the page, the flame was alive and it just wouldn't go away. The fifth question was very much about how I tend to read literature. Um, I guess this is a question that I was fascinated by because it's something that I always um, am curious about and I always like author's perspectives on these. This is what Alma said. This book is obviously about a wide cast of different kinds of women and has strong feminist tones to the, to the story which is greatly important not only to the plot but to the society we live in today. What do you believe is um, a readership in 2018 can learn from this book and what values and morals were important for you to portray in this story? The book was actually termed quote, feminist fantasy in at least one review that came up, which was <laughs> news to me. I didn't know such a thing existed and I certainly didn't set out to write it. I didn't set out to write anything that actually preached anything at all. If there is anything in it about values or morals, it's in one sense is truth and belief and courage and self-awareness and a willingness to look yourself in the eye, if you like, and um, talk, you, talk yourself down from ledges if you need to. The society we live in today, I'm not sure. We need to learn a lot of these lessons, I suppose. But the readership in 2018, we're, we're all very different people from what my girls were or could have been in their time. I strongly believe that they were themselves they were essential, they were who they were because they had to be, they needed to be, they lived a life that was necessary for the world. And every one of us lives a life that is necessary for the world because we are here right now and by definition we need to, I was going to say justify our existence, but that's not right. We don't need to justify anything to anybody. Um, 
we just need to live the best lives that we can live and be aware of that. Um, my particular gift is telling stories. Uh, yours might be something entirely different, but share that with the world because that is what you have to share. I'm not sure I have ever written a book that preaches any kind of morals at anybody at all. Everybody's values and morals are very much their own and um, it is not up to me to, to try and do anything about changing that. But if I can produce a picture, if I can produce evidence of a life well lived, if you like, even if it's just in a fictional story, then maybe that'll inspire someone to live the best lives that they can. And if I do that, then I have achieved a lot. And the final question, I just, I wanted to do a little bit of a fun question, ask her a bit more general question about books themselves, rather than just having it solely focused on the secrets of Jin Shea. And here is that question, and here is Alma's response. And then we have a fun question, which is why it's getting a fun answer, which is that, um, as the Duchess of Fantasy, which is my uh, persona in this, in this world, the question is, what are some of your favorite books? What books inspire you the most? And are there any other books that you would like to suggest to readers who love Jin Shea? Well, taking, taking this backwards, if you love Jin Shea, I suggest you pick up Embers of Heaven, which is the follow-up to that, 400 years later. And it's a story of what happens to the world of Jin Shea after 400 years have gone by. And um, if The Secrets of Jin Shei was Imperial China, Embers of Heaven is more or less set in the um, Cultural Revolution era of China. And it is one of the most, and this might sound weird given the context, one of the most romantic books I've ever written. So um, yeah, well, go on, go on to that. And then there is another book in a similar vein, a rich historical fantasy called Empress, which is more recent, which is based on um, the Empire of Byzantium and the lives of the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora. And um, what I'm trying to do in these books, and I'm actually writing another one right now, a big historical fantasy in a slightly different historical context, but just as in our world you have um, different geographical and historical eras like Imperial China, Cultural, Cultural Revolution China, um, Byzantian Empire, um, and in this latest one, 14th century Balkans, um, they all existed in the same world, in the same context, and same historical timeline. So what I'm doing is I'm writing all these books um, which exist in their own alternate historical timeline. So if you take a look at all of my historical fantasies, you will find interweavings of um, the other books in there. You'll find that all of these books take place in a coherent historical timeline of their own, an alternate history of the world, if you like. As far as other books are, the books you can't ask me what my favorite books are. I have got 10,000 books in this house and I love them all. I was going to you know, come up with the obvious stuff, like Lord of the Rings taught me how to build a world, because Tolkien is a master of that. Ursula Le Guin's books, pretty much all of them taught me how to build a world, because she does it as easily as breathing. Guy Gabriel Kay taught me how to build a world and create characters that leap off the page and, and makes make them make it almost unbelievable that they are not in fact real people so i would suggest lord of the rings i would suggest something like tigana or song of for um i would suggest the hainish novels by ursula le guin especially the later ones i love uh, the um the last book in that series the telling is probably one of my favorites in that entire series because it just makes me cry it's so beautiful other books that that I can throw out there are the Amber Chronicles by Roger Zelazny, um, the Catherine Kurtz Dirani books. Interestingly enough, uh, pure science fiction type offerings, I'm just rereading and rediscovering why I love Mary Doria Russell's The Sparrow and the Children of God books. So um, I read a lot. I read everything. I have thousands of books. I'm always reading something. If not reading, then rereading some favorite. And that's the, the best, biggest, best piece of advice I can give to anyone who wants to write is just pick up and read anything, everything. Just learn by 
learning from the masters. And there are some absolute masters out there. So keep reading. Love you all. The Duchess signing off. So that was absolutely wonderful, hearing Alma's answers to all of these questions. I, I personally gained a lot from them, and I really hope that you do too. I know that Alma has been watching these previous videos for the read-along, and I know that she has been very much enjoying the discussion that has been going into it. So I'm sure she would love to hear what you think about this video and her answers, and perhaps some of your thoughts also. Um, thank you a lot for watching, and thank you for all of those who have been joining in. Cannot wait to share with you the final video tomorrow, um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. It should go up in the evening. Um, but yeah, that's all for today. I hope you liked this. If you did, you're more than welcome to give me a thumbs up. And as always, if you haven't yet, you are more than welcome to subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you tomorrow for the final instalment of the MCS Read Long discussion videos. Bye-bye. <laughs>